In the previous lesson, we started looking at the concept of the separation of powers in the United Kingdom, and we explored this as a fundamental building block, a, a, a fundamental principle of the UK's constitutional setting. In this lesson, we're going to move on to the next major principle, which is this idea of the rule of law. And we're going to explore the rule of law in two lessons. We'll talk about the rule of law in its generality in this lesson. And then we will talk about the rule of law more specifically in relation to the works of A.V. Dicey in the next lesson. So we've been examining the various different principles of the UK constitution. Uh, we looked specifically with reference to the doctrine of the separation of powers, the way in which this applies to the UK's constitutional framework. Um, in this lesson, we're going to explore the next of these major principles. This is the idea of the rule of law in more detail. So as we noted in our lessons on the English legal system, uh, the rule of law is a particularly difficult thing to define precisely. Um, for those of you who want to have a basic overview of this, um, go over to our lessons on the English legal system that we've done already. But it's true, it is difficult to define precisely what the rule of law actually entails. Now, the majority of legal theorists, um, what they do in, instead is talk not about trying to define the rule of law by just giving us a simple definition, but instead try to highlight a number of the basic qualities that the rule of law entails. So looking at the different things that the rule of law encompasses rather than looking at a specific and strict definition of the rule of law. So we'll be focusing the majority of our time looking at some of those basic principles which have been elucidated by constitutional theorists. So ultimately, if we take a leaf out of um, the work of uh, Joseph Raz from 1977, we can see that there are a number of principles that can be said to encompass the rule of law. Now, for the most part, you would see broad agreement among many constitutional theorists about whether or not uh, each of these principles um, actually do form part of the rule of law. Um, at least there is a general consensus that um, there is uh, that, 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 that the rule of law is encompassing at least some of these principles. OK, so things like the principle of prospectivity in law, um, the principle of stability of law, the principle of clear and concise lawmaking, the idea of an independent judiciary the concept of natural justice, the idea of judicial review, judicial accessibility, as well as checks on state authorities. These come from Joseph Raz, as cited by Partworth in 2020. So these are basic conceptions of what really solidifies the basic understanding of what the rule of law is. We are talking about the idea that the rule, uh, that, that, that rule, uh, that law, sorry, should be um, prospective. It should be clear when lawmaking is done. There should be an independent judiciary that is able to adjudicate over um, various legal disputes. There should be the idea of natural justice, as well as checks on state authorities. So, Given this is the case, let's look at what some of these mean in more detail. Um, uh, we won't go through all of them because some of them are particularly very easy to understand. So, for example, clear lawmaking or an independent judiciary. These are things that are quite easy. Some of the things that are a little bit more complicated are things like natural justice, for example. And, as I've cited here, the concept of prospectivity of law. The idea that law has to be prospective essentially prohibits the idea that law can be retrospective. That is the the idea here. Okay, it could be you could you could essentially uh, define this principle uh, either in the positive or the negative. You could say um, law has to be prospective, or that law should not be retrospective. It ought not to be retrospective. What does retrospectivity mean when we talk about law? Well, I could not. And you should not be able to pass a law tomorrow which outlaws a com an act that is committed today, but then go on to prosecute individuals for that action. OK, so you can't retrospectively go back and start prosecuting people who committed crimes when at the time it wasn't a crime. So if I if, <clears throat> for example, um, uh, there was a, a repealing of all the abortion laws in the United Kingdom, everything to do with abortion laws. It was now outlawed completely. We lived in a uh, in a in a in a very um, deeply religious uh, Catholic um, state, and it became the case that um, that the abortions was illegal. The state should not then be able to go back and find every single person who has um, aided in, 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 in giving abortions or, or who has actually gone and had an abortion and then gone and prosecute all of those people. Because at the time, they were not 
crimes. And at the time, they were not um, committing uh, an, an act that violated the law. It's only now that they are doing so. So the idea that law should be not should not be retrospective is a very basic principle. The common law has consistently made it clear that law is not retrospective. Um, for example, in the case in 1870 of Phillips and Irie, um, we have this idea that retrospective laws are no doubt on its face of questionable policy and contrary to the general principle that legislation by which the conduct of mankind is to be regulated ought, when introduced for the first time, to deal with future acts, and ought not to change the character of the past transactions carried upon the faith of the ex then existing law. So when a new law is passed, it is going to regulate the future. It does not regulate uh, previous actions that had been committed by individuals. Retrospective law making is also not just only um, a violation of principles from the common law, it is also a violation of Article 7 of the European Convention on Human Rights, for which the United Kingdom is still a member at the time of recording, and I'm recording this lesson on the 20th of October 2023, uh, and at the moment we are still uh, members of the Council of Europe and the ECHR. So what about the idea of openness in lawmaking? Well, this idea essentially tells us that the law must not be vague, or it must not be inaccessible, or it must not be uncertain when it is being made. The law must be such that people are able to understand and follow the rules which are being put in place. OK, so there shouldn't be any kind of um, really, really difficult to understand, convoluted, inaccessible um, and uncertain um, ways in which the law should operate. It should be very, very easy. This not only fits into the concept of the rule of law, but it also fits into the concept of the logic of law. Law should be logical and coherent, and it should be very clear that the rules uh, that are in place are the rules that are um, very easy to understand. And this is why, by the way, whenever somebody tells me that doing a law degree is very, very difficult or that law is somehow a very complicated subject, I would um, come back to them and say that the thing about law is it is supposed to be very, very clear, very, very accessible and very, very certain in the way that it operates. That's not to suggest that it isn't and it's not to suggest that there aren't complexities that exist when studying law. But for the most part, it is quite easy. OK, and that is not only a, 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 a principle of sort of the logic of law from a philosophical perspective, but it is also a principle of the rule of law in this way as well. Again, according to Parkworth from 2020, in order for people to understand what it is that the law requires them to do or refrain from doing, it is necessary that the law is free from ambiguity and uncertainty. If you don't know whether or not you have to perform a certain act in a certain way because you don't know what the law actually says because it is uncertain as to what the actual rule is intended, then that is a violation of the rule of law. Continuing on then, what about the principle of natural justice? What does this actually mean? Well, natural justice is just the general principle that individuals have a right to a fair hearing on account of what is being accused. So... This is essentially the, the, the right to a fair trial, uh, the right to a fair, uh, a fair accounting of the facts, a fair accounting of what has been accused with the absence of any kind of bias. Um, it pertains mainly to the idea of the fair and free judicial process, which of course instills a number of further principles, such as things like the right to a fair trial, the right to a trial in, in, in and of itself, um, the presumption of innocence at trial and the following of, of, of proper and effective uh, judicial procedures. In addition to principles of natural justice, it should also be noted that the judiciary ought to be completely independent and it should be free from bias, which sort of fits into a principle of natural justice that we previously explored. If the government is able to influence the decisions of the judiciary, then this suggests that they would not be able to properly deliver the rule of law in cases where the government may be a defendant, which is actually quite a lot of the case uh, and a lot of the time the government is a defendant, especially within uh, administrative law and judicial review procedures. There's lots of examples where the government represents um, or, or is, is either a claimant or a defendant in judicial cases. This is achieved through a number of mechanisms, this idea of judicial independence, so things like security of tenure, security of pay, um, the, the sort of uh, obligation to ensure that pay is, is um, uh, fixed and there is no uh, question of bribery. 
Finally, then, let's think about what access to justice means. So the in the ability for an individual to gain access to justice is an important part of the rule of law. Um, the case of uh, the Crown and the uh, Wiltham uh, and Wiltham, the Lord Chancellor, um, says that access to the courts is a constitutional right. It can only be denied by the government if it persuades Parliament to pass legislation which specifically permits the executive to turn people away from the court door. This is quite interesting because it says here that ultimately access to court, access to justice is a constitutional right. And many would argue that this fits into the broader narrative of the rule of law. But then they qualify it and they say that we can only deny access to justice. We can only deny this principle if the government is able to get parliament to pass legislation. And this really ties into the question of which of the uh, which of these principles is most important, because what this is saying here is that it is highlighting a principle of the rule of law, but then it is talking about how this rule of law principle can be uh, trampled on in the face of the principle of parliamentary sovereignty. The idea that if the government uh, wants to deny the right of an individual to access justice, they can only do so by getting the uh, parliament to pass legislation. So that sort of brings you, gives you a bit of an idea as to the position of parliamentary sovereignty in this broader conversation, of which is, which is the next principle that we're going to get to in future lessons time.